His word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. His word has guided me through storms seen and unseen. I'm thankful today for the word of God. If you don't love God's word, you don't love God. You possess no more of God than you do of his word. And as we prepare our hearts to go into the word today, I believe that we have a message that's going to speak to your heart in a definite way. I want you to get your Bibles right now. Yes, I want you engaged with your Bibles, not just watching a television show. I want you to have an experience with your Bible where you come into a covenant relationship between you and the Scriptures. I don't want you to have a covenant relationship with me and not have a covenant relationship with the Word of God. So open up your Bibles quickly, whether it's in your phone or in your hand. Exodus chapter number 15, verse 19 through 27. We have a custom in our church. We stand for the reading of the Word because we respect God's Word, and I invite you to participate, if you will, again, the book of Exodus, chapter number 15, verse 19 through 27, when you have it, say amen. amen. For the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. And Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand. And all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider have drowned in the sea. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went out into the wilderness of Shur and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statue and an ordinance, and there he proved them. And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statues, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. And they came to Elam where were twelve wells of water and threescore and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. Can you say amen? Can you say amen again? I am attracted to the centerpiece of which I intend to add many accruements, but I am attracted to the fact that Miriam number one, brought her tambourine to the desert. And that she would, at this particular moment, beat her tambourine and all of the women would begin to dance. And I want to talk to you from the subject, dancing in the desert. Write that down, dancing in the desert. Can you say amen? You may be seated. Before I get lost in extrapolating the truths that the Holy Spirit has whispered in my ear from this text, it would be remiss of me if I did not congratulate my wife. Uh, once again, this is her birthday week, and I want to celebrate you and say happy birthday week, happy birthday month, as long as you want to extend it. Uh, it's your thing, girl. Do what you want to do. We're with you 100%. Dear Sarita, a little bird told me it is your birthday. I am thrilled to join the flock of well-wishers remembering you on your special day. May you have a terrific celebration filled with the love of family and friends. President Bush joins me in sending you our best wishes for a very happy birthday. Love, Laura Bush. 
Hello, Sarita. I've been invited to take this occasion to wish you a very happy birthday. And so I do. I wish you a very, very, very happy, happy, happy birthday. Hi, Sarita. I just want to wish you a happy birthday as someone that is so deserving because you're such an inspiration to all women, myself and all the women of the world. You set the perfect example of love and faith in the word of God and uh, just a great example for us. So thank you so much for your contributions and just have the happiest day ever. You so deserve it. Dear Sarita, Happy birthday to a woman full of grace and compassion. You are worthy of celebration not only today, but every day. Barack and I send our warmest birthday wishes. On this milestone occasion, I hope you are surrounded by the love of family, friends, and all those who know you best. Today, as you take the time to reflect on life, I hope you take tremendous pride in all you have accomplished and in the ways you have touched the lives of those around you at the Potter's House and around the world. I, for one, am grateful for all you do for women and children in your many successful and meaningful programs at the church and for your unwavering support of the bishop. I loved having you guys join us for the Becoming Tour and hope it's not long until we see you again. May your year ahead be filled with lots of laughter, exciting adventures, and much joy. Happy birthday, Sarita. You and your loved ones have my very best. With love, Michelle. It's my privilege to wish Mrs. Sarita Jakes the happiest of birthdays. It is said that one only rightly sees with the heart and that much of what is essential is invisible to the eye. It's with a heart full of love and concern and care that Mrs. Jakes is able to coax to life that which has been hidden and buried and that which is a treasure in the lives of many. Women who would otherwise have their gifts and talents overlooked or forgotten are able to assume a position of responsibility and lead highly productive lives. Women find their voice because of her coaching and encouraging. Women from boardrooms and garages, bay windows, beauty shops, pulpits, pews, women from garages and laboratories and classrooms and uh, operating rooms and studios all together begin to get a sense of confidence that they can live a purposeful life and release whole young men and women into a world that is now filled with uncertainty and ambiguity. She is a woman who is often calm in chaos. She can be quiet in a storm, and yet she has the fortitude and the courage to struggle to bring the future to life, not only for herself, but so kindly and generously for so many others. There is so much to her. She is a woman of rare grace. She is a woman that is an eloquent witness, uh, so much so until she cannot be confined to a verbal one column ledger. It's not enough to uh, embrace all of who she is, her depth and her breadth. But we're grateful that for us, she is a North Star and one whose light is rekindled over and over again in the lives of others. Whether she's working with the developmentally delayed, whether she's concerned with debutantes, or whether she's bringing her design and dignity to homemaking and to being an entrepreneur. We're grateful that God has put this woman in a place where we can intersect and observe her life. She is for us a candle that is repeatedly rekindled and we are grateful for the inspiration. Happy birthday, Mrs. Sarita Jakes. And now let's join Bishop Jakes for the word. Dancing in the desert. The dichotomy of the subject itself is mesmerizing to really think about the whole complexity that these women would with dancing and deserts don't go together. Deserts are a place you survive, not dance. And, and yet there is this dichotomous oxymoron between the activities of the woman and the location in which the activities are mentioned. 
you don't see people dancing in the desert and yet these women are dancing in the desert. I'm going to get to that a little bit later, but there's something about women and there's something about worship and there's something about word and there's something about water. There's something about women. I, I've got, I just finished a book called When Women Pray. There's something unique about women themselves and how they pray, not to exclude the men, but there were no men dancing. The women responded to this moment, and I want to explore what would make women dance like I did when women pray. Women, you, you hold a unique role in the kingdom of God. You have to understand your spiritual role. You fought for your corporate role, then you fought for your political roles, but you also need to understand your spiritual roles. There are something that you bring to the table that is unique to the species that nobody else can do quite like you do it. That's why Jeremiah said, send for the women of mourning and let them take up a wailing. Uh, he understood that there's something unique about when you pray and when you worship that sets you apart. That's why Jesus went down to the well and sat by the well and waited for one woman to come to teach her how to worship because when women get it, Yokes are broken. Bondages are destroyed. People are set free. Generational curses are released. Destinies are altered when women understand who they are. So just think about that as we go into the text because this text starts out with the flamboyant dance of women who seem not to even notice the desert, but they're in the middle of the desert with sand dunes and dust hills standing all around them and heat so overwhelming that most people would have passed out these women grab their tambourines and begin to dance in their colorful garbs around and around and around on the edge of the banks of the river. And they dance while Pharaoh died. They dance over the corpses of the deceased and dead horses were on the banks and still they dance. Don't lose your dance, sister, or you will not be able to make it. You have to keep your dance, no matter what the desert is you might be in right now, you have to keep your dance. Uh, somebody write down, keep your dance. Uh, there's something to be said, though, about this text. This text is very interesting because in the span of a few short scriptures, we keep hearing about water. It is at the Red Sea that they begin to dance. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about water, and I want to talk about God, and I want to talk about God and water, and water and God, because there is a theology to be extrapolated from the text as it relates to the understanding of God and water. And first of all, we must realize when we first met God, we met him at the water. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. The first thing God moved on, and the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the waters. The first thing God moved on was water, and it's important that you understand that there is a theology to be extrapolated about God and water. I'm not sure that I can fully grasp it, but I just want to point out to you that there is some kind of thing between God and water that is so important that all throughout the Bible, the theme continues as the law of first mention suggests that it would, that we will always see some unity, some connection between God and, 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 and water. Pharaoh drowned uh, in, in, in the water. Yes, he did. Yeah, the, 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 the priest had to wash in the water before they could go into the holies of holies new generation uh, that was born in the desert had to pass through the Jordan in order to get to the promised land. There's always something about God and water. He taught Moses how to draw water out of a rock. Uh, Moses smote the rock and the water spewed forth out of the rock, not out of the creek bed, not out of the river, not out of the ocean, but God birthed water out of a rock. Later, he told him to speak to the rock and the water would gush water out of the rock. There's something about God and water. I can't figure out exactly what it is, but there's some synergistic opportunities for us to understand more clearly that God seems to have this, this preoccupation with water. Jesus starts his ministry at the water. He's down at the Jordan River, and he comes down to the Jordan River, and John is baptizing at the Jordan River, and John looks up from the baptism at the Jordan River and says, Behold, the Lamb of God 
which taketh away the sins of the world. And Jesus came down, and the Bible says straightway he went down into the water and rose up out of the water. And when Jesus came out of the water, the heavens opened up. Look at God and water, water and God, water and God and God and water. When he came up out of water, the heavens opened up, and a voice from heaven spoke and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus' ministry started with water. Let's go back and understand that the first miracle that Jesus did was done with water. Uh, his mother Mary said, we've run out of wine. And he, he told the servants to go and get some water, six firkins of water. And when they brought the water to Jesus, it was out of the water that Jesus turned water into wine. There's something, there's something between God and water. That's why baptism is so important. There's something between God and water. I know you think it's just a ceremonial ritual or routine optional to have or not to have, but don't underestimate the power of water. Water has power. Water has force. Water has might. Water has significance. And water has a theology. Peter met Jesus walking on the water. Jesus called his disciples while they were standing by the water. There's something about God and water. Lydia was baptized right outside of Philippi at the riverbanks of the water. Philip had told the eunuch, here's water. What does hinder me from being baptized? There's something about God and water. Wherever you see one, you see the other. He reveals himself uh, with water. He told the woman at the well, if you drink of the waters that I have, you will never thirst again. There's something about God and water and water and God. And here we experience some things about God that we would not understand otherwise if we did not develop an appreciation for God's attraction toward water. He moved upon the face of the water. And then the Bible said on the sixth day of the creation that God created man out of the dust of the earth he formed him. But you must also understand that the human body is made of water. So it must not have been dust alone. It had to be water also. The brain and the heart are 73% water. The lungs are 63% water. The skin contains 64% water. Your muscles and kidneys are 79% water. And even your bones are watery at 31%. So when God got ready to make man, he made man out of water. So when the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the water, the Spirit of the Lord also moved upon man, which was also water. Your body is composed of water. You can go longer without food than you can without water because water requires water. You always need whatever you are. Spirit needs spirit. Word needs word. Water needs water. Your thirst is made out of what you're made of. You want what you are. You are made of water and God loves water and God loves you. To put the text in context then, we must understand that when God gets ready to deliver the children of Israel, who would have thought that God would have fought Pharaoh and his army with the simplicity and the natural substance that we call water? We don't normally think of water as a weapon. We don't think of, of it as a tool of warfare. If I were going to fight Pharaoh, I would never fight him with a water hose. I would never shoot a water gun at him, but God shot a water gun at Pharaoh, look at God, God, God. God can use anything. He doesn't have to have special artillery. He doesn't need a M16. He doesn't need an atomic bomb. When God gets ready to arrest anything, he can arrest it with something you never thought of. Here we are in this country thinking about nuclear warfare and atomic bombs and all types of things and all of a sudden a germ is released, something nobody could see and it shut down the whole world with something you can't even shoot at. That's why it's not wise to get into a fight with God. His ways are past finding out. His methods are past finding out. The way he fights is so strategic. It'll be something in the air. It'll be something in the ground. It'll be the jawbone of an ass. The way God fights is so strategic. Who would have ever thought that Pharaoh would be killed by a water gun? But when God gets angry, anything is lethal in his hands. When God's had enough, he'll take you out with something that should have kept you alive. 
he killed Pharaoh and what he was born in. The same substance that when his mama's water broke, eased the labor pains of his birth, was the same water that brought him in, was the same water that took him out. Be careful all the enemies of God. You got to be careful about being an enemy of God because God will take you out with something that you never even thought was a weapon. As Noah, when God gets ready to work with water, God will send rain down from heaven. Noah had never even seen rain, and he built an ark around something he had not seen. And all of a sudden, it began to rain down from heaven. Not only that, but God broke up the cisterns of the deep. God had water on a hole, and it lifted the ark up. And everything that was saved found life in the water, and everything that was unsaved found death in the water. Isn't it funny how God can bring life and death out of the same substance at the same time, depending on where you are. He was killing one and making the other one live with the same water that lifted Noah, destroyed Noah's age. God, God, God uses water. He uses it. He uses it. He uses it to cleanse. He uses it to change. And in my text today, it is difficult to ignore the brilliancy of, the, of God's mind in that this text is not just filled with the beating of tambourines and timbrels and the skipping and the dancing art of Hebrew women who are celebrating their liberation, but it is also contains three different illustrations that God is trying to teach us of how he will work with water. It is the introduction of the children of Israel after 400 years of being estranged from the relationship that they had with God. For 400 years, they had not offered up a sacrifice to God. For 400 years, they had not had a ceremonial cleansing or washing to God. For 400 years, they had not worshipped God. Their ideas about God had become distorted by their association with the Egyptians. And yet, as much as they could remember of him, they prayed unto him. Now, we will know that their memory is altered because when they got ready to build an image of God, they built it like the Egyptians. So we know that they did not have a clear clear image of God. And in spite of the fact that their theology was wrong, their voice was still heard because God told Moses, I have heard the cry of my people crying out to me. God heard the cry of a people who had not worshiped for 400 years, of a people who had primarily lost their vision of who he was. And yet, though his vision was veiled from their memory with the fragments of what they had left of their understanding of God that was passed around the dinner table with slaves from generation to generation, 10 generations whispering things that they could only remember about God. And yet God, it was enough God that when they cried unto him, God still heard him. You're not too far off. You're not so far, he won't hear you. You're not so bad, he won't hear you. You're not in so deep, he won't hear you. 400 years since they had served him, but when they cried, he still heard them. I want to pause a moment and thanking him for hearing my cry. I just need a David moment. David said, I love the Lord because he heard my cry. I love him because he heard me. I was, evidently, I know I wasn't worthy to be heard, but he heard me anyway. I didn't have a clear vision of who he was, but he heard me anyway. I had not served him nor sacrificed well enough to deserve to be answered, but he said, I love the Lord because he heard my cry and pitied every groan as long as I live and troubles rise, I will hasten to his throne. You can't help but love a God who answers the cry of a fallen man. 400 years they had fallen away from God. 400 years they had been trapped in the bondage of slavery. 400 years since they had offered up a sacrifice. 400 years they were living in a strange land up under the bondage of a hard taskmaster. 400 years they had been infiltrated and indoctrinated with false theological understandings about God. And yet when they cried God heard him. Good God Almighty. What an amazing mercy that God could hear the cry of a child that had not sacrificed nor served him for 400 years and that he would dare to own them to the degree that he would fight for them. That God would fight for the fallen is mind-boggling. 
that God would fight for a group of slaves, a, a group of broke, disadvantaged, disenfranchised slaves, and yet God went to war for them as if they were valuable. Slaves were expendable commodities, bought and sold, given as gifts at weddings, and yet God told Pharaoh, Israel is my son, my firstborn son. He's my child. He's my child. He belongs to me. And until you turn my son loose, I'll kill your sons. Until you deliver my people, I will wage war against you until you let them go because I have heard the cry of my sons, prodigal though they were, wayward though they may have been, backwards though they may have been. Confused in their vision of who I am, they must have been. And yet I heard their cry. There's something about a parent and the cry of a child that is distinguishable. There is a cry that you can make. I don't care what's going on in the house. There is a cry that you can make and everybody keeps on watching TV, but there is a blood curdling cry that when you cry it, every mother will drop her plate and every father will drop his toolbox or something. There's a certain bond that when you hear the cry of your child, your adrenaline begins to escalate. Your nerves stand on edge and all of a sudden you're stronger than you were before you heard the cry. It is an instant that God puts between the parent and the child. God said, I've heard the cry of my children. I will fight you with stuff that you have never been fought with before. I will fight you with flies. I will fight you with frogs. I will fight you with locusts. I will fight you with water. And so he devised a plan, a method of escape, a commitment to their deliverance. God always has a plan to get you out of what you're into. If you stay, it's because you choose to stay. God has a way of escape. There is no temptation taken us such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer us to be tempted above that which we are able, but will with the temptation, with the temptation, not after the temptation, with the temptation, also make a way of escape. God is not sitting in heaven playing with his phone, trying to figure out how am I going to get them out of this? Oh my God, they're in a mess right now. What am I going to do? Any angels got any ideas? How am I going to fix this? Let me see if I can call somebody. God already had the answer before hell asked the question. Yeah. So in our text today, we are seeing the unveiling, the apocalypse, the revelation of the strategy of God. And God says, I want you to take the blood of a lamb and apply it to the doorpost, and I'm going to send a death angel to pass by. And he said, don't worry about how many people go down. When I see the blood, oh, sure. when I see the blood, you don't hear me. When I see the blood, you don't need no other shelter. When I see the blood, you don't need a tent. You don't need refuge. You don't need armor. You don't need medicine. When I see the blood, Blood, I, I will pass over you. I got to stop a minute and thank him for all the times he passed over me. Have you ever had God pass over you when you should have been dead, but he passed over you? You should have been cut off, but he passed over you. You should have been destroyed, but he passed over you. You should have been eaten up, but he passed over you. You had no right to have that place, but he passed over you. If he don't give me nothing else, I still got to praise him because he, I got to dance because he passed. Oh, I ain't praising him for my car. I'm not praising him for my house. I'm not praising him for my shoes. I'm not praising him for no kind of stuff. I'm praising him oh, because he passed. That's the way we used to have church. 
Nowadays, they're praising God for stuff because they got a promotion. They're praising God because they had an expensive dress put on sale. They're praising God because they got a, a check in the mail. They're praising God for stuff. But we used to dance because we dipped our robes in the blood of the Lamb, and I'm saved. You don't hear a lot of that anymore. And yet God brought them out. In their ignorance, he brought them out. In their blindness, he brought them out. With their flawed theology, he brought them out. With their bad attitude, he brought them out. Murmuring and complaining, he brought them out. Disoriented, he brought them out. Confused, he brought them out. You don't get out because you deserve to be out. You don't get out because you're good enough to get out. You get out because God is good enough to bring. He brought them out. He brought them out. He brought them out. Now you must understand that Egypt was the America of its day. It was the superpower of its era. It stood head and shoulders above any other kingdom of its time. It has gone down in history as being the preeminent government power of its age. We are still worshiping around, going around, taking pictures around, studying around, observing the, 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 the magnitude of the brilliance of the kingdom of Egypt. We're still studying. Their pyramids are still standing thousands of years later, their architectural designs are still being studied. Their craftsmanship was known in all the earth. Egypt was the superpower of its era. Pharaoh was the kind of leader that you could not have an international summit and leave out the Pharaoh of Egypt because Egypt was a superpower. You have to understand that these people are not fooling with no jack leg, upstart Johnny come lately individual who's an egotistical maniac. Pharaoh was a force to be reckoned with. He decided whether men lived or died. He made a decision and you couldn't catch your breath. He made a decision and armies were destroyed. Women were violated. He made a decision and in entire villages were set on fire. He was not to be trifled with. Had he risen again, that's why Moses ran and spent 40 years because Pharaoh was not to be fooled with. It is that kind of power that is chasing a group of slaves out to the riverbank. Can you imagine the kind of fear they felt when they heard Pharaoh huffbeats coming in behind them? He didn't just use his chariots. He picked out 600 chosen chariots. The fastest in the fleet, the mightiest of the crowd, the most skilled warriors that he had. 600 men chasing a bunch of farmers down to the Red Sea. And if God didn't make a way, they would have been totally destroyed. I feel the Holy Spirit saying right now, there's somebody watching me right now that you're in a predicament that if God doesn't make a way, you're gonna to totally be destroyed. Man can't help you, friends can't help you, neighbors can't help you, your uncles can't help you. You're in a crisis mode situation and whatever that is that's coming up behind you, it threatens to totally annihilate you. And that's why God's got you watching this message right now. Because if God be for you, He's more than the world against you. And he's about to pull you out. And if you miss the rest of the message, this is your jump off point. You could dance right here because God's about to snatch you out of your worst nightmare, of your deepest fear, of your worst anxiety. God is about to pull you out. When God gets ready to move it, he will move it out of the way. And I know you hear the huff prints. 
And I know you feel the threat because the enemy always threatens before he destroys. He's a terrorist. He wants you to be fearful and frightened and afraid. It's not like this was a sneak attack. They could hear trouble coming to terrorize them. Their emotions were frozen. Their will was paralyzed. They were so distraught, they started murmuring and complaining against God and Moses. They wanted to go back into Egypt back into bondage, back into rape, back into slavery. Anytime you want bad, better than good, you're a friend. I want to talk to people who are so afraid that you chose bad over good. You chose wrong over right. You chose to stay in a house full of violence rather than to get out there on your own. But this is the day of your liberation. This is the day of your emancipation. This is the day that you are set free. And the Bible said that God used what was in his hand against what Pharaoh had in his hand. Pharaoh had 600 chosen chariots, skilled men of warrior. God had water and wind. <laughs> and the Bible said he spoke to the wind and the wind blew the water back for miles and miles. Then he told Moses, he said, not only will I bring you out, but I'm gonna bring you out comfortably. I'm gonna bring you out comfortably. See, the Red Sea experience is where God teaches Israel separation. So point one is God will separate you at the Red Sea. He says, I am going to teach you separation. I am the God of separation. I separated day from night. I separated light from dark. I separated water from ground. I separated the firmaments that were above the water from the firmaments that were beneath the water. I am the God of separation. And so you don't have to be afraid of what's trying to overtake you because I'm the God of separation. And I will put a barrier between you and it and I will set you apart because you're mine. I am the God of separation. Somebody write down, he's the God of separation. He's the God of separation. And God uses water to teach them that I will separate you by the water. And the Bible says that they step down into the dry seabed of the Red Sea. And there they go walking through on dry ground because when God brings you out, he'll put you in an environment so good that you don't even have to get muddy. Later on, later on in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul will exegete this text and tell us that what we call a Red Sea deliverance, God called baptism. For he said, did not God not baptize the children of Israel unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea? I didn't know I was at a baptism service. I thought I was coming out of a fire escape. But God says, oh, this is not just an escape. This is a baptism. And I had to baptize them because they went in the water as slaves. They came out of the water as sons. I had to baptize them to put a line of demarcation markation between how they define themselves then and how they define themselves now, which is what baptism is for. For as many of us have been baptized into Jesus Christ, have been baptized into his death, that likewise we may be also in the likeness of his resurrection. We went down into his death. We come up into his life. They went down so that who they, the enemy was chasing could be pronounced dead. We died in the Red Sea. All of your slaves died in the Red Sea. Didn't nothing come out of the water but sons. But when Pharaoh got ready to step into the way that God had made for his people, instead of it being a way that the wicked could walk through too, when the wicked stepped down into the water, God told the wind, go back, and the waves collapse, and they drown. 
I know he is the master of the winds and the waves because in the New Testament, when the disciples were crossing over on a ship, they woke Jesus up with sleep in his eye and he stood on the bow of the ship and he spoke to the same elements. He said, peace be still. And the Bible took note, the winds and the waves obeyed him. That is the same wind and waves that obeyed him in the book of Exodus. When he spoke to the wind and said no more, it it stopped blowing back the waves and the waves came in and Pharaoh drowned. Now see this with me, if you will. 600 chariots, horse-driven chariots are drowning in the Red Sea. The animals, the chariots, the swords, and the shields are floating in the water. Josephus, the historian, says that bodies were littered all up against the banks of the Red Sea, coming up out of the water dead, so that when the women started dancing, they were dancing on the dead. Ah! Hallelujah! Who would ever thought that God would deliver you so well that you would dance on what was dancing on top of you? And I know it sounds foolish, but that's why I'm telling you to dance in the desert. That's why I'm telling you to dance in the desert, because while you're dancing, your devils are dying. While you're dancing, your diseases are dying. While you're dancing, your debt is dying. While you're dancing, your enemies are dying. And when Miriam grabbed her tambourine, she did not just do it out of joy, she did it out of warfare. <laughs> because when you praise God, he is magnified. And the more you praise him, the more he'll work for you. So when you see God bringing you out, don't just stand there and look at him, but grab your tambourine and start dancing in your desk. Oh, if you praise him, if you praise him, if you praise him in your house, if you praise him in your living room, if you, oh. There they were, dancing in the desert. Little did they know that when these women started praising God, they would set off a catastrophic series of events with water. Remember when God told the woman, if you believe on me, as the scriptures have said, out of your belly, She'll flow rivers of water. Some things aren't going to happen till you praise him. Some things aren't going to happen till you speak up. Some things aren't going to happen till you grab your tambourine in the middle of your desert and say, I refuse to be depressed and I refuse to cry and I refuse to walk around this house looking all sad. I'm going to grab my tambourine and devil, I'm going to dance on top of your head. I'm going to dance. Give me some old time. Holy Ghost Pentecost. I'm going to... I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm dance, dance, dance on him, dance on him, dance on him, dance on him, dance, 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 dance. And they all went down. Not one of them escaped. The death count was 100%. Not one man lived to tell what happened. Because when God says, I will destroy your enemy, he means I will totally annihilate your enemy. And I don't care how big he is. God says, I will bring him down. And the Red Sea closed in. But the Red Sea closed in, not just to destroy Pharaoh. It also closed in so that none of the lesser troops could follow the pursuit. That's point number two. Point number three. 
it closed in so that when the children of Israel got into the middle of the desert, they could not go back. <laughs> hey! Tell your neighbor, I can't go back. I'm too far in. I can't go back. This God does to teach us about separation. So as the text moves along, the water is still flowing out of this dance. For the Bible says that they were three days into the wilderness. And when they were three days into the wilderness, they came to a place of water. But when they got down to drink, the water was bitter. Bitter does not just mean that it tasted bad, it was dangerous to drink. And the people cried out. Whenever the people cry out, the leader is always miserable. The people cried out against Moses. We have nothing to drink. And the only thing you can do as a leader is when the people cry out to you, Moses turned around to God and said, we have. All you can do is echo. The job of the minister is to echo the voice of God to the people and echo the voice of the people to God. And so Moses is echoing to God what the people said, like he echoes to the people what God has said because Moses stands between the people and God. He tells them what God says. He tells God what they say. The people have nothing to drink. They ask God for water. And he answered with a tree. I want to talk to the people who prayed for something and the answer doesn't look like the question. You got down on your knees and you prayed for water and he answered with a tree. This might be the most important moment in all of the scriptures because this is the moment of sanctification. This is the moment we went from separation to sanctification. This is the moment that not only is God trying to answer their craving, he is letting us get a peekaboo, a glimpse at Jesus. Just a glimpse. It's just a glimpse. See, you remember what Jesus told the woman at the well? If you drink of the water that I have, you will never thirst again. He did a water commercial for the Samaritan woman. He did a taste test. He said, if you keep drinking what you're drinking, you're gonna always come back. There's something wrong with your water. But if you drink of the water that I have, you will never thirst again. They prayed for water. She said, give me this water that I thirst not. They prayed for water. And God answered with a tree. The tree is a type of Calvary. The tree is the rugged cross. The tree is a prophecy of the only thing that God had that would turn the bitter waters of your life sweet. God told Moses, I know the problem is the water, but the answer is the tree. Good God Almighty! Your problem may look like water, but your answer is the tree. It is a foreshadowing of the cross. It doesn't look like it has anything to do with the problem. But God told Moses to throw a tree at the water. Throw a tree at it. Touch your neighbor and say, throw a tree at it. Throw a tree at it. Elbow him and tell him, throw a tree at it. Throw a tree at it. I know you need money, but throw a tree at it. I know you're praying about water, but throw a tree at it. Throw a tree! So they threw a tree into the bitter waters of Mara, and the water turned sweet. The water that was bitter turned sweet by the inclusion of the tree. 
You'll make the darkness light before you. Whatever's wrong, he'll make it right. All of this is in this text right here. The same way that Jesus took the water and turned it into wine, they threw a tree into the bitter water and turned it into sweet. The answer is the tree. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. It was a wondrous attraction for me. And I'll cherish the old rugged cross because you see the cross turned my bitter water sweet. If you're watching me right now, I don't care if you're bitter because of drugs, bitter because of crack, bitter because of cocaine, bitter because of abuse, bitter because of molestation, bitter because you're stripping on a pole. I don't care what the bitterness is in your life. The tree will turn it sweet. This tree is Calvary. They threw a tree in the water and it changed. This is the place of sanctification. Sanctification will take what's dirty and make it clean, what's bitter and make it sweet, what's dark and make it light. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? And it all happened because of the inclusion of the tree. You know what your life needs right now? It needs a tree. You got a degree, but you need a tree. You, you got an investment, you got dividends, you, but you need a tree. You got capital gains, but you need a tree. You're beautiful, but you need a tree. Nice hair, but you need a tree. You got a career, but you need a tree. The reason your life still tastes bitter is because you have not thrown a tree at it. The tree is a prophetic utterance of Calvary. The only thing that can turn the bitter water sweet is an old rugged tree. And so here comes Moses rushing down to the water, carrying a tree, just cause God said so and throws the tree out into the water and says, drink! You see, whatever was bitter in the water, the tree absorbed it. It took it away. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Every curse that was contrary against me, he took it away. Every law that stood against me, he took it away. Every demon that stood against me, he took it away. He absorbed it. He was wounded for my transgression. He was bruised for my iniquities. Just as my peace was upon him. With his stripes, we are healed. He absorbed it on the cross. He who knew no sin became sin and absorbed the punishment for my sin that I might be vindicated in the sight of God just as if I had never done it. He turned my bitter water sweet because God threw a tree at it. That's the second lesson in the text. The third lesson in the text, and I'm almost done, is that after that they had drank and were full, we cannot stay around miracles. Those one-time, one-off experiences that God does in our lives, we can't stay there. What's wrong with the church today is that we have built monuments off of old revelation and we have hung our head on something God said to somebody 150 years ago as if God was through talking when they died. You must understand the difference between a moment and a movement. God did give them a moment but he didn't mean for them to stop moving and hang around that moment and build a doctrine and a theology and a denomination around a moment because God wanted them to keep moving. He had something else for them up ahead. I'm almost done. But in those few short passages of scripture, they went on a little further. Write down, I gotta go a little further. 
I can't just hang around what grandma taught me. I got to go a little further. I got to go beyond what my father's taught me. I got to go a little further. And when they came to Elam, point number three, and I'll be done, I'll be done. When they came to Elam, God got ready to teach them the third step of the lesson. When they got down to Elam, God taught them sustainability. Okay, so we've gone from separation to sanctification to sustainability. Because this was not a moment done with the tree. When they got to Elam, they came into a prepared blessing. Somebody had been there before. I know somebody had been there before. I can prove to you that somebody had been there before because there were 12 wells in Elam. There were 12 wells in Elam. Now, wells are not natural experiences. It's not a lake, it's not a pond, it's a well. Somebody had to dig it. But God had somebody dig it so that when they got there, the well would already be there. I want to tell you that God will give you houses that you didn't build and vineyards that you didn't go. That somebody's digging right now a well so that when you get to the place, the water will already be made and God will sustain you. Now, when they threw the tree in the water, they drank, but they didn't pitch their tents there. But when they got to the 12 wells at Elam, the Bible said they stayed there a while. They pitched their tents there a while. I prophesy God is going to give somebody sustainability. Not a one moment, one off experience, not a short time experience for you to look back on with wondrous attraction and always refer to the good old days that used to be. God is going to give you a sustainable blessing. There were exactly 12 wells of water. And get this, my brothers and sisters, there were 40 palm trees. This sounds like a resort. There are 40 palm trees, at least 40, at least 40. Might have been 60, 60, it, wait, you don't understand. In the desert, there are palm trees and wells in the desert for slaves. God's got a blessing for you. You can have it. Reach out and grab it. God's got a blessing for you. God's got a blessing for you. You can have it. Reach out and grab it. God's got a blessing for you. The tree is already built. The wells are already dug. All you got to do is pitch your tent. And there, with the wells all around, and the palm trees for shade, he gave his beloved rest in the wilderness. And there they danced and rejoiced and worshiped and said, we'll stay here a while. He gave his beloved rest. He put him in a resort, in a desert. Now he was already a cloud above them by day and a pillar of fire by night, but he gave them palm trees for beauty, for shade. Somebody, God is about to give you some shade. It's been a scorching hot season, but the Lord has prepared palm trees. Now the other tree went in the water, <laughs> but this one grew up out of the desert. And so we keep seeing trees, we keep seeing trees and we keep seeing water. And God is teaching us something about trees and water and out of the desert grows these palm trees for shade. Do you need shade? Do you need shade? Have you been walking through the scorched, dry place of a pandemic? Barely making ends meet, 
watching the news every night, stressed out and at your wit's end? Do you need shade? They sat under the palm tree. And there they rested in the desert. I prophesy rest over your life. I prophesy God is going to bring you God is going to bring you into a place of rest. Some shade tree is waiting for you to lay down under it. And the well has already been dug. You have always dug your way out of everything the enemy ever sent against you, but not this time. God said, I am going to bring you into another man's labor. You're going to drink from a well you didn't dig. And I am going to give you shade from how much it cost you to be you. I am going to bring you into rest. And you say, how do I get to that rest? You will find that place of rest when you learn how to dance in the desert. As long as you murmur and complain, you'll never find your palm trees. But the moment you decide, I'm going to find me a tambourine and I am going to beat that thing to the glory of God. And I'm going to worship God in the middle of my desert. I hear the sound of the bells ringing of rejoicing coming into your house. Ah! I hear the sound of rejoicing coming into your desert. I hear the sound of rejoicing coming into your hospital room. I hear the sound of rejoicing coming into your marriage. I hear the sound of rejoicing coming into your business. I hear the sound of a relentless voice of praise breaking out. Sing thou barren woman, thou that didst not conceive. Oh, start rejoicing right now. I know you don't see it, but there's going to be a rejoicing coming in your life. And God is going to bring you into a resort, a time of rest, a time of peace, a time of provision, and most of all, a place of sustainability. And you'll be able to pitch your tent there and sit down and rest a while because he has provided for you. I want to pray for you right now. You're in the desert. Be honest, we all are. 2020 has been a dry place. It has been a place of uncertainty. Not quite into our promised land. And hearing the reminders of our past behind us. This has been a year that we as a people, particularly people of color, have been reminded of our bondage like never before. We have heard the sound of Pharaoh chasing us yet again. How? Oh! We've been reminded that the right to vote could be lost. We've been reminded that we could still be hunted and shot down and killed. We've been reminded that we could still be destroyed and how much we own and how smart we are has nothing to do with it. We have been this text. But God says, I'm going to bring you into a place of sustainability. I'm going to bring you away from your fear and I'm going to fight off your enemies. And I am going to give you rest. And what we need to do right now throw a party and dance in the middle of the desert and confuse the enemy because I want you to know in the middle of a pandemic and an economic crisis somebody's building wells for you 
and you're going to come into a place of abundance because change is in the atmosphere and all the people of the earth ought to rejoice because the only person who ought to be mad is the devil if you ain't drowning in the red sea you ought to rejoice because god is breaking the back of oppression and moving away the curse of the memory of fear so that the slaves would not have to spend the rest of their lives on the run. That's why Miriam danced. It wasn't just that Pharaoh was dead. The threat of him coming up again was destroyed. God says, I will wipe out the memory of what horrified you. I got wells waiting on you and palm trees above your head. And if you got the faith to stand right in the desert and dance right now, I got the power to bring you into a place of sustainability. I got, a, I got the power to give you equity. I got the power to break the yoke of your yesterday. And you will be many things, but you will never be that again. You will go through many tests, but you will never go back to that again. You will have much opposition, but you will never go back to being Pharaoh's boy ever again. That's why she danced. She danced because women are mamas. She danced because she knew her sons would not be born in captivity. She danced because she knew her nieces and nephews would not have to make bricks and change beds. She danced over the possibility of a brighter tomorrow. And so I'm calling for women everywhere to lead us into the dance and lead us into the worship and lead us into the prayer that breaks the curse. That tells hell you can't have another generation not another generation you cannot have my daughter you cannot have my son you cannot have my grandchildren you cannot have my great-grandchildren i'm calling on the women to dance in the desert until yokes are broken and dance in the halls of congress and dance all over the white house and dance all over D.C., and dance all over the hospital ward, and dance in the emergency room, and tell hell you can't have not another generation. God shut down the church so you could stop dancing in the church and dance in the place where the power is needed, in the hospital room, in the boardroom, in the courtroom, in the halls of Congress, in the White House. God wants your praise in the streets. He wants your praise in the alleys. He wants your praise out there where people need to see you dance in the desert. Why would we stay in here and dance amongst ourselves when the whole world has gone dry? So lift your voice like a trumpet and shout unto God with the voice of triumph right in your house. Shout to your baby boys know they're free. Shout to your granddaughters get their degree. Shout until the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. I am commanding you, I am imploring you, I am flat out begging you to dance in your desert. 2020 has been a dry place. But while it has been dry for us, buildings are still going up. Skyscrapers are still being built. Bridges are being made across lands and territories and people are taking over while some are going down, some are going up. And I decided I'm not, I didn't come this far. I didn't come this far to go down. I didn't come this far to be a statistic. I didn't come this far to go out, going back into the, the curses of my grandfathers. I didn't come this far 
to fight the same battles that John Lewis fought. No, I might fight another battle, but I won't sit back and let you take over territory. You can't have my child. You can't have my house. You can't have my peace. You can't have my life. The devil is alive. I stand before God. And let all the saints rejoice. Dance in Ethiopia. Dance in Lagos, Nigeria. Dance in Accra. Dance in Johannesburg. Dance in Melbourne. I know the numbers are going up, but dance right in the middle of Melbourne. Get in the streets of Sydney and lift your voice like a trumpet and give God the praise. And dance in Seattle. And dance in Chicago. And dance in Canada. And dance in the UK. And dance in London. Oh my God, do you hear what I'm saying? Dance in Birmingham. Dance in Mobile. Dance all over the earth. In Italy, in Switzerland, in Iraq, in Iran, in Venezuela, in Mozambique. Dance before him. Sing before him. In South Africa, dance. In Chile, dance. In the Fijis, dance. In the Bahamas, dance. In Jamaica, dance, dance. Dance in your desert, dance. Because if you will give God your dance, he will give you his water. Your thirst is over. Your thirst is over. Your thirst. The thirst. It's over. It's over. And I decree and declare a new season in your life. I decree and declare water in your desert, streams in your desert. It's coming from the water. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ in the free pardon of your sins, I want to throw a tree in your water. If you've accepted him and you've never been baptized and you're being chased by your past, you know what? You need to find a place and go down to the river like Lydia did, like Philip did, like Jesus did, like the Hebrew children did, like the new generation did and be baptized. If you've done that, just dance. Dance. Because when you dance in the wilderness, you let hell know I don't believe this. This won't last. And as you give him a dance, he'll give you living water. Can I pray for you? Just me and you? Maybe you've never had anybody that you could be honest with. Pray for you. I don't want to pray for your image and who you pretend to be. I want to pray for who you really are. I want to pray for the scorching heat that threatens you in your dry place. I want to pray that you get your dance back. 
Now, no need of me praying if you're gonna go back and act like you were acting before. This prayer is for people who refused to go back to the bondage they came out of, the murmuring they came out of, the conversation, the storytelling, the vernacular, the rehearsing, the same dead stuff over and over again. I wanna pray for your liberation right now. I wanna pray that your Pharaoh drowns right in front of your face and you find your tambourine. You hear that? Find your tambourine. and beat it in the devil's face. Spirit of the living God, we want the water you have for us. If we have to crawl for it, if we have to cry for it, if we have to pray for it, if we have to reach for it, give us our dance back. Give us our praise back. We humble ourselves in your presence. We drop our heads in humility. I will not leave this desert without my dance. I will not leave this desert without my dance, without my son, without my daughter, without my house, without my peace. And I don't care how long I got to fight for it. I'll fight all night. I'll pray early in the morning. I'll pray before the break of day. I'll go to sleep praying and talking in tongues. But you will not curse what God has blessed. Never again. I take a stand this day. And so let the children of God dance. Right in that apartment. Right in your grandmama's house. Look crazy all you want to get up and dance. Move. Dance. In your desert. God bless you. May heaven smile. I pray you dance. I pray you dance again. Right in the middle of the desert till waters flow. Until streams come out of the earth. Until you find your palm trees and you find your well. I pray you dance. That's my message. That's it. I'm through. I leave you to your dance.
Let's go.